Welcome to Lecture 4 of Networks, Friends, Money, and Bytes. And today's topic is Netflix. Let me first warn you, though, that throughout this course of 20 plus 1 lectures, if you plot the length of the video lecture okay, against these 20 lectures, they go up and down. The average might be 75 minutes across all the modules. Okay, so they may go up and down, you know, if I interpolate. Now this lecture four is actually going to be, you know, by far the longest uh, lecture. Uh, you will see uh, that we have quite a few modules and each module is kind of long because we have to introduce both the concepts of collaborator filtering, okay, individualized recommendation by scaling out the system, the network, as well as the mathematical language of more optimization theory. Again, if you plot the level of mathematical um, difficulty involved or the amount of symbolic operation involved against these 20 lectures. So they go up and down quite a bit actually. You know. I'll say that this lecture is perhaps by far the most mathematical one. You've, if you can pass this lecture, you probably can face any of the remaining mathematics throughout the rest of the course. Okay. So to some degree, uh, we're climbing up a hill today. And this hill is both conceptually little involved and mathematically would require some hard work as uh, uh, climbing up a real hill would demand. But if you can climb through this hill, then the rest of the course should be actually uh, much easier, especially uh, on some of the lectures coming up. Okay. Now, having said that, let's first review what we had uh, in the past the three lectures. We saw three beautiful equations, and they are very useful equations too. The first one was in lecture one, DPC, distributed power control used in 3G CDMA data networks. And it says that for each transmitter of logical pair i, the transmit power p at the next discrete time slot t plus 1 should be whatever it is right now, p sub i of t, times a gain parameter. And that parameter is the ratio between the target SIR gamma and the currently achieved SIR of this link. Now this does not change over time as far as this algorithm is concerned. It is a constant. And this varies over time as different people uh, change their transmit power level. And we saw that this is essentially an implicit feedback signal telling you whether you should increase or decrease your power. And the second equation that is beautiful and useful we saw in lecture two can be summarized as following. That is the payoff function for the ith bidder in an auction, u sub i, is a function of all the bidder's bids, just like the SIR is a function of all the transmit powers. It's a vector b. And it is the difference between your private independent valuation v and the price you have to pay, which depends on all the bids. And this function, the price, which is not the power now, the price as a function of all the bids, the shape of this function is determined by the designer of the auction. And for different kind of function p of b, you will induce different kind of behavior by the bidders. They will bid different bi star, the optimal according to some metric b. For example, whatever maximizes the utility. Now, of course, uh, this is assuming you actually win the allocation if you uh, do not get the item, then the utility is zero. This definition of payout function, which also highlights the fact that you can design the auction and then that will induce different bidding behavior, is the second equation. The third one, which we touched upon last lecture, can be written as the following. Simply the vector pi star transpose equals pi star transpose times g this is the Google matrix that we defined last time. And it is defined in such a way that the corresponding eigenvector 
corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of 1 can be uniquely defined and efficiently computed. Okay, so this defines that Google page rank score, which further leads to the rank ordering of the web pages. Now, if you count how many times DPC is used in the mobile world, if you count how many times auction is used in many contexts, including the online space, if you count how many times the Google page rank is used every time you search on Google, you can tell these three are powerful equations. They are simple, but they are very, very widely used. So now we're going to continue this uh, track of four lectures. We talked about um, power control, distributed protocol. We talked about second price auction, talked about page rank, and now collaborative filtering for recommendation, like on Netflix. And these four lectures also introduce the language of optimization, then game, then graph, and now learning theories. Now, the backdrop is Netflix. To those of you who are in the US, you know Netflix very well. It started its DVD rental business a while back, actually, in 1997. So the story says that uh, the founder of Netflix was uh, tired of paying uh, fees to the DVD rental stores. If you remember those days, there were a lot of those on the street corners. And if you don't return the DVD in time, uh, or the VCD in time, or the tape in time, then you pay extra fees. He says, well, that's not very appealing to me. So instead, he says, you can keep the DVDs as for as long as you want. Okay. As long as you keep paying the monthly fee, then that's actually a great thing for the company. You don't return, I don't send you new ones. Okay, So you can keep paying my monthly fee without getting any new DVD. This idea is going to show up again in a completely different context of sliding window control in TCP, congestion control. That would be in Lecture 14. But it's effectively the same concept. You don't return, I don't give you more. And by 2008, in the US, there were about 9 million users of Netflix DVD rental. And then, that year or so, Netflix started trying out something quite new of using the internet to deliver video. Internet as the medium instead of the postal service to deliver video. So, the content is stored in some video servers. It's sent through the internet and maybe wireless networks to your internet connected devices which could be TVs or set of boxes but also could be game consoles, smartphones, tablets, PCs and so on. And by 2011 spring it's got 23 million customers. And in summer of 2011 uh, it was counted that about one in every four a quarter of the bits going through the internet that month was Netflix traffic. That was huge. Okay. Now, of course, uh, video is uh, a very big files, and therefore, if you count by volume, um, you're going to get big numbers of percentage. But still, one in four, that's a lot. And then in September 2011, you may remember that Netflix tried to split into a different, two different businesses, separating DVD rental online streaming, and then they later put them back together. But the billing uh, still what uh, became separate. Now later, we will look at the technology network involved for multimedia streaming over the internet in lecture, I think, 17. We look at Netflix and Amazon Prime, Hulu, HBO Go, IPTV, and so on. Look at the differences across the models. Today, this lecture four, the focus is, however, on the social network dimension of recommendation system. Okay. You and I, the customers of Netflix, also form a network. These 23 million and bigger number now, they form a social network. They don't directly interact. But the way that they watch and rate movies will be used and leveraged by Netflix to make better individualized recommendation. Think about this way. You are on open online platform. 
okay, whatever that platform might be. And there are maybe you know, 100,000 of you. By scaling out, scaling up a social network, we actually can then scale down the individualized recommendation because we get to see other like-minded people like you how they behave what they like and don't like and we have much more data so even if you don't provide a huge amount of activity on the platform we get to see others and this is the basic idea of collaborative filtering cf now there are many kinds of recommendation system for example on amazon you may notice that each time you refresh the uh, home page after you log in they will recommend different kind of products to you that's largely based on what's called content-based filtering okay. basically if you s purchase certain kind of products before like certain kind of electronics then they will recommend similar electronics to you in the future if you buy a book written by Stephen Hawking then they will try to recommend uh, new books by Stephen Hawking. That is called content-based filtering. Okay, look at what you bought, what you liked, and then recommend accordingly. YouTube, we will see later in a few lectures time, uh, the way they make recommendations is largely driven by the so-called co-visitation counts. Briefly speaking, it means that it will look at how many users watch these two videos uh, back to back okay. and then if so then we put a score to the co-visitation count between these two videos say A and B okay. and then this will give you a way to start quantitatively decide what uh, video should you recommend we'll come back to this later in Pandora if you have used that it is a mostly expert driven recommendation of mix of music but as a consumer you get to thumb up or thumb down just like in some discussion forums you get to vote up or down now Netflix does not want to use expert driven movie review even though there's no shortage of movie reviewers professional ones out there it instead uses a collaborative filtering the idea is that not only will look at what you like or bought we we'll also look at what similar people, similar to you, liked and uh, watched. The question is, how do we define similarity between people? Or flip the other way around, between movies. Before going further, let's first more rigorously define this recommendation system. A recommendation system is a very helpful feature. Okay? for stickiness of the consumers, for inventory control, and so on and so forth. Now, in the case of uh, Netflix, you can think of this as, a, say, a black box. There are inputs, there are outputs. What are the inputs? First of all, the user ID. Okay, That's your login. We're going to index user by you. Second, movie ID. We're going to index each movie by I. And then, there will be of course a rating which is really a number drawn from one two three four five stars and we call this r sub ui okay r for rating of user u on movie i and the time that this happened this review was entered is t ui of course there's also the review of text okay and we're not going to talk much about text review in today's lecture. So you've got U and I and RUI and TUI. Now how many RUIs and corresponding TUIs are we talking about here? Actually a lot. Think of millions of users and tens of thousands of movie titles. Of course only a few percent of the users actually watch uh, all the movies out there and of uh, or any substantial number of movies out there. And among all the movies that you actually watched, you likely will only rate a few of them. Some people like me actually rate none of them. I just don't like rating movies. Uh, but a lot of people rate, uh, but they don't necessarily rate every single movie that they watched. Despite that, we're talking about 
on the order of the billions of RUIs for Netflix. Now, it's a much challenging problem actually when you just have a very few rating in your database, uh, the co-star problem. But Netflix doesn't have that problem now. All right, those are the inputs. What does the recommendation system do? What is the output there? The output primarily, of course, is the predicted rating. Let's call that R hat UI. Okay. Now, in the case of Netflix price, they actually know the true RUI. They just don't tell you, the competitor, into the price competition. In that case, you actually know the ground truth. Then you can compare your prediction R hat UI and the actual RUI. But of course, in the real operation of Netflix, they don't know the ground truth. That's why they want to recommend you to watch that movie. Okay, So you're going to just have to uh, believe that if it works well in the test set uh, uh, where you know the ground truth, it's going to work well in other part of the system too. Okay. So this R hat, however, it could be a fractional number. It could be a real number. For example, 4.2 star. You cannot rate 4.2 star, but the prediction might say 4.2. So you can interpret that as maybe 80% of the chance of this uh, user U will rate it, this movie I, with 5 star, and maybe 20% of chance you rate it as 4 star. Maybe that's an interpretation of number 4.2. This R hat may also be going above 5 or go under 1. But then we have to clip it so that if it's above 5, it's 5, it's under 1. we we'll just call that 1. All right. How do we compare two recommendation systems? What is the metric of figure merit that we're going to use to do the comparison to say, look, this recommendation system is better than the other one? What do you mean by better? Well, there are three levels of understanding here, going from most relevant but least tractable to uh, most tractable but perhaps least relevant among the three. The first level is that, of course, eventually what I care about as Netflix is customer satisfaction. If I recommend you to watch some movie, do you like that recommendation in the end? Okay. That actually is just very hard to gather uh, data. The second level is, all right, at least I want to know what is the prediction effectiveness. Okay. If I recommend a movie, do you even watch it or not? Let alone you like it or not. Again, that's hard to collect. So we're going to look at our proxy, just like in Google PageRank. Eventually, what really matters is uh, does the uh, search inquirer actually find the resulting search listing useful or not? But that ultimate test is very hard to quantify and collect data about. So they use the um, uh, this a page rank to say well I'm going to say this is the importance of nodes. Here we're going to just say let's quantify the notion of prediction error here by looking at r hat ui and r ui. Okay. Again, how do you know r ui? In real life, you don't. But uh, when you compare different recommendation systems, you can hold some known data as uh, ground truth and then use that as the test data set. Okay. Well, of course, I would look at the difference between the two. Maybe this overshoots, maybe it undershoots. So it can't just be the difference. It could be the absolute value. Okay. It could also be the L2 norm, the square of the difference. Okay. So if I overshoot by one star or undershoot by one star, after squaring, they're all positive numbers, meaning uh, positive uh, error okay, term. So I'm going to square them. And how many do I have? Let's say I've got a C of uh, those UI pairs where I would like to uh, base my comparison of recommenders on. Okay, So I have to sum up across those UI pairs, and there are C of them this squared difference. But since you squared things, you actually changed the scale. To bring the scale back down, people often put a square root. And that is so-called root mean squared error, RMSE. It is effectively 
so-called L2 norm of a, a vector, the vector being the error vector, difference between R hat and R across all these UI pairs, you can to take a look at the each entry of this vector, square it, then average it, then take the square root. Now, of course, when you minimize an error, whether you minimize the square root of the error or without the square root, the uh, solution won't change. Okay, so uh, mean square error or root mean square error, either one can be used equivalent as the objective function that you want to minimize. All right, so now we're looking at this uh, RMSC or MSC as the quantitative metric describing how wrong your recommendations are across this set of test points. And we'll use that as the proxy for these eventual goals. So our job is not to say, give me the inputs, okay? U and I and RUI and TUI. I'm going to find a way to make recommendations and give you an output R hat. Okay? I will train this black box by looking at known R and, known, and the resulting R hats. How do I train them? By minimizing the RMSC. Then I say, all right, good, I'm done with training this black box. Now throw at me some uh, questions where I don't know the ground truth R. Maybe you as the examiner knows the ground truth R. Well, good, and then keep it to yourself, and I'm going to make a guess R hat. Then you check your ground truths, see how good I am. That is the spirit of Netflix price, which was announced in October 2006. And the challenge is to say, can you make a really good recommendation system? I'll give you data to train your recommender. Now, can you make it work really well, better than what I currently have, well, I meaning Netflix.